Planet 4, once inhabited by engineers, was home to egg sacs that contained the pathogen, as seen in Harvest on LV-223. Once released, the spores emitted find a human host and implant the embryo for the Neomorph. Certainly this is a different form of the pathogen as seen in Prometheus as black goo held in vials that, when making contact with the human host, leads to the human host's mutation and DNA disintegration. As seen with Fifield, the human becomes a monstrous, stronger and more violent version of themselves. When compared to the goo, the motes act quite differently. This version of the pathogen is airborne, and the cloud of spores is almost sentient as it makes its way to the host. And of course, the pathogen implants the makings of a parasite, the neomorph, as opposed to directly affecting the host's DNA makeup. In the ten years between the Prometheus mission and the Covenant's landing on Planet 4, clearly some changes have been made to the effects of the pathogen, and some stages have been removed in arriving to the final results of an alien parasite. The pathogen, as seen in Prometheus, infects Holloway when he ingests a sample of the pathogen, leading to his mutation, and is killed, but not before impregnating Shaw in the early stages of his infection, which led to Shaw carrying and birthing the trilobite. Shaw seemed to be otherwise uninfected and was simply incubating the parasite. When fully grown, the trilobite develops into what can be best described as a giant facehugger which attacked and impregnated an engineer with its parasitic embryo, and finally led to the birth of the deacon, which bursts out of the host. In many ways, it's as if in the pathogen to deacon equation, Shaw is essentially the egg. She hosts the first life cycle stage of the parasite. As the trilobite came from Shaw and found a host to impregnate, so does the facehugger coming from the xenomorph egg. The trilobite impregnated the engineer leading to the deacon, while with the xenomorph as we know it in its most common form, is created when a facehugger impregnates a human. The equation leading to the neomorph would lie somewhere in between. The egg sacs would be acting as both egg and carrier of a form of the pathogen that already carries the genetic coding which results in the neomorph. The Planet 4 egg sacs seem to be acting as both egg and facehugger in this equation. So where did these egg sacs come from? Were they indigenous to the planet, or were they engineered? Was this a part of David's experimentation during his decade marooned on the planet, or was it created by the engineers? Even with supplemental shorts such as The Crossing and Advent, as well as reproductions of David's notes and illustrations which shed some light on the marooned android studies, there's still a large gap to fill when it comes to the ten years between the events of Prometheus and Covenant. However, the novelization of Alien Covenant has David going into much more detail about his experiences with the pathogen. When first meeting with the crew of the Covenant, David offers an explanation of the virus and the resulting parasites. David explains, The pathogen was designed, engineered might be a better term since those of us on the Prometheus came to think of them as genetic engineers, to infect any and all non-botanical life forms. Its sole purpose is to reproduce. The offspring will stop at nothing to do so. It is their rationale for existence designed into them by the engineers. They kill by reproducing, an elegant method of warfare if you take the time to think about it, or of experimentation if one prefers that description. A very thorough way of cleansing a world of unwanted life forms. If even a single offspring of the virus is left, it will not stop until it has found a living host. It seeds, then it moves on. As you have seen, the seed incubates, mutates, and matures with astonishing speed until it is… reborn. The pathogen itself has an extremely long lifespan, he explained. Given a suitable environment in which to exist in stasis, it can lie dormant for hundreds if not thousands of years until a suitable host presents itself and awakens it to commence the cycle again. If not controlled, a single application is quite capable of rendering an entire world permanently uninhabitable. While it is dormant, the virus is completely inactive. There was nothing for your ship or companion, competent as their respective instrumentation might be, to detect. He waved a hand. It's not as if it's floating in the air like a common germ. The ability to lie inactive for a very, very long time is one of the things that makes it so dangerous dangerous to its engineers as well. 
David's interactions with Captain Orem are also expanded upon in the novelization, giving further insight into David's understanding of the Accelerant's abilities, particularly when human and engineer DNA is brought into the equation. The pathogen took many forms and proved extremely mutable, he explained. Fiendishly inventive, in fact. The speed of its mutability is one of its defining characteristics and makes it such an effective weapon. How do you design a defense against something that is capable of constant change in response to its surroundings? How could your body's own immune system possibly defend itself? A genetically engineered countervirus, for example, or a human body's own white blood cells would immediately be met by the pathogen adapting itself, he continued. To counter the counter, and so on. As a weapon or a method of biological cleansing, it is simply impossible to defend against. The original liquid atomizes to particles when exposed to the air. It then reproduces in whatever host it happens upon, and eventually gives rise to more liquid, which at the appropriate time atomizes, and so on and so on, the cycle repeating itself almost endlessly. That is, until there are no more hosts. Ten years on, all that remains outside of the original untapped containers of virus are these gorgeous little beasts. Like all good naturalists, David continued, I observed the fecundity of life at work. When engaged in such study, patience is everything. Patience and time. I am naturally imbued with the former, and circumstance has provided me, however unwillingly, with plenty of the latter. From the egg sacs came these parasites. Airborne and gifted with a very primitive but dutiful hive intelligence, once released into the atmosphere, they are relentless in their purpose. The shock troops of a genetic assault, always searching for a potential host. Entering the host and rewriting the DNA, the pathogen produces mature offspring whose appearance and characteristics are wholly dependent on the nature of the host itself. The progeny of a parasitized insect, for example, would look very different from the creature that issues from a quadruped host. The ultimate aim, as I gather it, was to produce something like these enviable unions, my beautiful bestiary. Orem found himself filing past a row of tall, menacing bipeds. Their tough exoskeletons gleamed like black steel. Though there were slight individual variations, all had in common the same threatening aspect, long tails ending in scorpion-like points, curving elongated skulls devoid of visible eyes, and jaws filled with teeth shining like chrome chisels. Further down the row of mounted specimens were less successful variants. Smaller, pale and white, ghastly and deformed, from the perfect to the demented, the stuff of nightmares, or amused. Some were intact while others had been partially or wholly dissected, not unlike the erect, skinned corpse of the engineer. As he led the way down the line, David let his fingers trail gently, almost lovingly, across the mounted bodies. Marooned here so lamentably, he explained, I had nothing but time to watch and to learn. Eventually, my innate curiosity got the better of me, and with nothing to occupy myself other than the compiling of a simple collection, I began to do a bit of genetic experimentation of my own. Some crossbreeding, hybridizing, what have you. I like to think that the ill-fated inhabitants of this world, the original engineers, would gaze on my work with approval. Orem stared at the line of the specimens. It wasn't endless, but it denoted a vast investment in time and energy. He couldn't escape the feeling that there was much more at work here than the simple desire to avoid boredom. So much effort expended, he said. To what end? Why? It's not all that complicated. Cut off here without a single living creature for company, I could remain in complete silence and isolation until the last of my systems eventually ran down and I... died. Or as you doubtless would prefer to say, stopped. On the other hand, I could engage my mind and body in a long-term project designed to keep everything functioning at as high a level as possible. That is, after all, what my own engineers intended, so I occupy myself with the only viable toys that are available to me. Turning, he met the captain's gaze directly. Haven't you ever wanted to play God? As I understand it, this is a common fantasy among humans, and as long as weapons are not involved, it's not a harmful one. In order to play God, however, one must have subjects. I have only what this planet has provided. What exists on this world and what I was able to salvage from the crashed engineer ship. I think, on balance, that I have done quite well with very little material.
The question remains, however, about whether or not the Neomorph, and ultimately the Xenomorph, or Protomorph, became the result of David's own studies and experimentation, or if he was following work already laid out by the engineers. David's explanation to Orem suggests the latter, but given the misleading information David conveyed to the humans regarding the release of the pathogen, which wiped out all life on the planet, and his explanation of Elizabeth's fate, he wouldn't exactly be a reliable source of truth in the matter. Do you think the development of the pathogen that led to the Neomorphs and Xenomorphs was already engineered, or was this all David's creation? Comment below and let me know what you think. And as always, I'd like to thank you very much for watching. I really appreciate it, and if you enjoyed this video, please make sure to give it a like, and you can also subscribe for all the latest videos from the channel. And if there's a topic you'd like to see covered, please let me know in the comments below. A very, very special thanks goes out to our Wayland yutani executive, M. Yorick, who is part of the Patreon Hive. I'd also like to thank the Queen of the Hive, Lady Anne. And if you'd like to join this hive and support the channel, check out my Patreon page for exclusive posts and contests. In the meantime, you can catch up with Alien Theory over social media. Follow at Alien underscore Theory on Twitter and at Alien Theory YT on Facebook and Instagram for more. And until next time, this is Alien Theory, signing off.